Hi everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, video session on uh, mid-phase augmentations with hyaluronic acid. My name is uh, Dr. Byrne. I work in practice in Gothenburg, Sweden as an aesthetic surgeon, meaning we do surgery two days a week and uh, injectables and consultation three days a week. And uh, most often we combine procedures so many of our surgical patients, they uh, also do injectables. So let's look at the mid-phase and uh, an anatomical approach to successful treatment. I mean the mid-phase is the most growing indication uh, uh, in the phase right now. We do mid-phases basically in uh, three different ways. One way as a rejuvenation but also as an enhancement as we can see many women do with their makeup putting highlight on their cheekbones so it's not only mid face it's also cheek augmentation and the third way is as a remodeling so today in our practice we basically do no cheek implants we only use injectables we use hyaluronic acid or if our patients looking for a permanent result we also use autologous fat i don't recommend anyone to use permanent fillers meaning injectable silicone because that might also need, mean uh, permanent problems for our patients. So hyaluronic acid has been around for more than 20 years now and, and what is really hyaluronic acid? I mean we know that it's a Swedish invasion, invention coming from Uppsala as Restlane being the first in the world. We know that hyaluronic acid we have all over the body. It gives us moisture and it contains a lot of water. It's been shown in, in scientific papers that it stimulates the skin, the elastine and the collagen. So hyaluronic acid is important in many ways. But looking at it chemically, it's actually water with a polysaccharide, meaning it's water with sugar, uh, probably the most expensive water of the world. So during those last 20 years, it's given us whole new possibilities to combine it with neuromodulators or what we call botulinum toxines. We can do a lot of different treatments. This patient has been treated m during many years with HA fillers as Restylane together with neuromodulators as a pure rejuvenation. No surgery has been done whatsoever. But what we see more and more today is also facial contouring. It's not only about rejuvenation. We do a lot of beautification, changing proportions within the face, changing balance and creating harmony. But we also have our younger patient with the signs of the aging process, which don't really need surgery, but we can do a lot with what we call full face treatment or facial liftings or lif uh, liquid lifts. This patient, she had volume added in her tear trough or hollowness underneath her eyes, her mid face, her nasolabial fold, and a little bit in the lips. Another growing indication is what is called medical rhinoplastics. We can do very much to create a better proportion of the nose to make it more harmonious, meaning that it actually looks smoother and smaller. So in many cases today, uh, surgical rhinoplasties are not necessary. This is also a very good method as we want to touch up after a surgical procedure. This patient came to me actually doing her lips. Every time she came, she tried to hide her right ear uh, with her hair. But of course, you cannot really hide anything from your doctor. This is a congenital deformation, and she was afraid of a surgical reconstruction. I suggested her to reconstruct the ear with some volume using Restylane Perlane, and this is actually immediately after. We had a very long durability. We can also easily do scar corrections at this and we also know that hands are the ones that are showing your age today. So I think that hand augmentation or hand rejuvenation actually is one of the most growing treatments around the world using hyaluronic acid. Buttock augmentation if the patient doesn't have any own autologous fat to use also hyaluronic acid can be used 
or calves augmentations as with this patient. This young patient came to me and asked for a more model-like or fashionable decotage. She wanted a clavicle augmentation. Of course, I'm always curious, so I tried to find what different alternatives there was. There is a way by augmenting the clavicles by inserting uh, metal prosthesis, which is a quite traumatic procedure. But what we did for her instead is that we added some hyaluronic acid above those clavicles and we made a liposuction of her decotage. This patient, 43 years old, she had a pacemaker inserted. She didn't want to go to the beach, she didn't want to wear a dress with a deep decotage. So we actually camouflaged that pacemaker with some hyaluronic acid. And we can do it as a lot of different things. For this guy, as a combination for male body contouring. So many of you might know about Restylane and Emerval or hyaluronic acid as dermal fillers. And in a way that was what it was in 1996 when it was introduced. But dermal filling means injecting something into the skin. And this is not what we do today. Today we create implants, we do microsurgery. So I would like to call it a tissue filler instead. Of course, using tissue fillers have more demands on the products use. And we have today quite a few different good quality products to choose from. To understand why we want to use what product, it's also important to understand different characteristics of hyaluronic acid gels. So basically, a definition of the gel is a colloid suspension of a solid dispersed in a liquid. This means that all gels have particles. If it doesn't have a particle, it's not a gel, it's a solution. But we also know that larger particles gives us a higher viscosity. But it's not only viscosity which is important for the gel. We also have different cohesivities. So if we have higher cohesivity, meaning a more sticky gel, we also have a less risk of migration. And if we put these two together with cohesivity and viscosity, we get the value of elasticity. And elasticity actually equals the amount of energy which the gel can store without collapsing. So if we have a high viscosity gel, it's harder and stiffer, but if we still want it to, to stay, we need to have it more stickier. So this high elasticity equals high lifting capacity, which also equals what, what is called G prime value. So why do we have different gels? But of course, we treat different areas, different areas with different movements and also different tissue covers. So let's have a look at Melina, one of the nurses working at our clinic and her nasolabial fold. The nasolabial fold is a line running down from the nose to the corner of the mouth. When she's relaxed, it's not so deep, but when she smiles, it's much deeper. So if I compare this, to one of my other patients, Robert, he has quite a different nasolabial fold. It's a heavier face, it's deeper when he's relaxed. So maybe I would like to have a more smooth and dynamic gel for Melina, and maybe I like to look for a stronger gel for Robert. We also treat in different depths as subdermal, dermal depth, even submuscular, or as I will show you later on, subperiosteal. We also have different patients. Different patients are looking for different needs, but they also have different physiological conditions. So if we compare Ron Reagan with Madonna, they're definitely looking for different characteristics in their beauty. What would happen if we would make Ronald Reagan as smooth and wrinkle-free as Madonna. Definitely would be a mismatch and he would lose the dynamic and harmony 
of his face. So there are some things that we need to take in consideration when we choose a product to use in our treatments. And basically hyaluronic acid has two clinical pr uh, properties. How are they to inject and how do they behave once they've been injected? And looking at injection properties, we have different injector pressure depending on the gel, gel but also uh, different gorge required on the needle or micro cannula. And gorge equals basically the size of the needle. So in some areas, in some cases, you really want to avoid large cannulas and needles, and that could be a reason to use a smoother, lower viscosity gel. But of course, more important is the in vivo properties of HA gels. Different gels have lift, different lifting capacity, which means that they have different uh, elasticity values as we just talked about. Different gels also have different softness and firmness. Sometimes we want to have a really firm gel as when we create a chin, a nose or a cheek, but sometimes we're looking for softness. We don't want to have the same stiffness and firmness when we do a lip augmentation. Different gels also have different degree of displacement. So what does this really mean? It means the tendency of the gel to spread in the tissue while it's been injected. So could it be good or bad to have a high degree of displacement? Today we also do a lot of skin boosting meaning that we're looking for the hyaluronic acid effect on the dermis which will create a rehydration, a stimulation of elastin and collagen. And in a case like that we will want to have a higher degree of displacement so we don't have to make as many injection points. On the other hand when I build the ridge of a nose I definitely don't want to have a high degree of displacement I want the gel to stay where I put it. Different gels give different rehydration, which of course is important if we use skin boosting, but are not at all as important if we do a chin augmentation as a remodeling. Different gels have different hydrophilic factors. All hyaluronic acid gels actually absorb water, but in different degrees. Sometimes it's good, but for example, when we treat the tear trough, the hollowness underneath the eyes is not good at all. So we want to have a gel with very low hydrophilic properties. Different gels have different durability, of course. So all these in vivo properties are important for us to take in consideration when we choose the right gel. So today I mainly work with the Restylane and the Emerval range and I think they combine and they supplement each other very good. So here we see some of the Restylane and Emerval gels. All the black gloves are Restylane gels as the Emerval gels you find on the white gloves. And here you can easily see how the Emerval gels are more cohesive but also a little bit smoother. So let's start looking at Restylane Perlane, for example. Perlane is a very all-round volumizer gel. We have very long, long experience with the gel. It's quite high in its viscosity gel, uh, value, which means that it's a strong gel. It's good for definition. As compared to Emerval volume, which also is a very strong gel, but it's smoother as you can see. It's higher in cohesivity, and the combination of viscosity and uh, cohesivity gives us the important value of elasticity, meaning lifting capacity, but in different ways. So if I'm looking for a more dynamic and smoother gel, I might want to go for the Emerval. And if I want to have a stronger gel that just gives a sharper definition, I might want to choose Restylane Perlane. 
So to really understand that, let's have a look at MRVL volume as we see here. You can see the really big dynamics and also the responsiveness of the gel. Higher in cohesivity, but smoother and lower in viscosity. And of course, that might be a good gel to work with when we work with dynamic areas. So this is how I like to look at Emmerville volume as a soft responsive gel compared to, for example, Restylane Perlane, which is a harder and stiffer gel. So we have different products to choose from. And can we choose from just a picture like this? Of course we can't. We need to see and understand the dynamic of the faces as with all aesthetic cosmetic planning, even though it's surgery or injectables, it's dynamics that we work with. So we have all these gels to choose from with lower or higher viscosity, with lower and higher cohesivity, and we have different patients with different dynamics. But not only that, different patients have different wishes and looking for different results. And basically, we can divide our mid-phase treatment into three different categories. We can make rejuvenation, enhancement, or remodeling. We will talk a little bit more about that later on. And this is a young patient, and she look she's looking for an enhancement of her cheekbones, not only rejuvenation of her mid-phase, and she wants that sharpness, so this is the reason why I would like to choose Restylane Perlane. So let's have a look at our patient's uh, mid-face and the different anatomical landmarks because they can very easily be defined. So by lifting up the mid-face, we define the medial malar fat pad. Behind this, we find the pre space. This is a very good area to use for augmentation. Medially, we have the nasolabial fat pad. Superiorly, we find the teethroff ligament, dividing into the upper and lower orbicularis retaining ligament, and then we have the buccal maxillary ligament, true and false, dividing the nasolabial and malar fat pad. So this is the basics of uh, the mid-face anatomy. We can choose different entry points, laterally, most common in Europe, medially, Asian, and then sharp needle perpendicular into the area. They all have their pros and cons, and I think that there are many ways to, to roam, so of course different techniques can be used to achieve as good results. Then the one million dollar question. Where should we put the volume? Well, if we use a, a morphological approach by drawing up the Mahler fat pad, we know that if we just stay within that uh, pre space, we will rejuvenate. But we can also enhance some area by adding more volume, for example, laterally to enhance it, or we can actually remodel the mid-face. So different approaches and we put volume in different ways, not only calculating just one spot to show it. I also would like to point out this very nice paper uh, published by Dr. Wong, which showed us the pre space which we've been using for many, many years. We also need to take in, in consideration the retaining ligaments. And I showed you the buccal maxillary ligament dividing the two fat pads of the patient. And this we need to respect. So for this patient, it's an enhancement. She wants to have higher cheeks. She's a Caucasian. And we could talk for a long time on different uh, ethnical and cultural wishes. But here it's basically more lateral approach. We can do sharp needle or we could have a lateral approach with our patient, entry point lateral from the malar fat pad or medial as is more common in Asia. From the medial approach we can easily reach 
the Tesroth, we can reach the whole pre sigmatical space. And honestly, they all have their pros and cons. I always draw my patient uh, sitting up with full gravity, but since gravity changes the face. This is a young patient. We're going for an enhancement. I draw both sides to find the similarity. Always clean not only the entry point but the surrounding area working with the micro cannula. We have a lateral approach lifting up that Muller fat pad and very easily coax yourself into the pre sigmatical space. And finding that you can do with a micro cannula as it's blunt, you can define anatomy with it. In the pre space, the cannula is dorsal of the Mahler fat pad and it runs freely. This is the area where we want to add the volume. So if we look at this, it's very little resistance, so then we know where we are located. The gel contains lidocaine, so it's not painful at all for the patient. If I go more superficial in the fat pad, I will have a high resistance. And as you can see, the filler will move with the smile if I do injection in this area, <clears throat> just as it did for Putin. So this is how we create um, artificial results, by adding filler in the wrong anatomical layers. So in my opinion, we need to go deeper so we don't create this chipmunk effect. So let's go down to the deeper layer and we can find the pre space once again. We inject a little bit and the Muller fat pad will move above the filler, giving the patient a natural result with the smile and the dynamics. We can also continue even deeper on the bone entering the subperiosteal space and it will be even more contained in this. The cannula is very deep and just as we put breast implants behind the breast even though it's in front or in behind the muscle it gives us a better lifting capacity. We also know now from ultrasound studies that we just conducted that we have a much longer durability with those deep injections in the subperiosteal space because hyaluronidase are, are digested and broken down by natural hyaluronidase. So hyaluronic acid will stay longer in these uh, tissue levels. So let's have a look at the injection. It's in the pre space for this patient. I'm working with wrestling perlane to create a nice definition for our patient. Minimal volume in the mid-face is one cc per side, I would say. Here you can see how the Muller fat pad move above the filler, giving that natural smile for the patient. We can also have a medial approach, common in Asia, as we know. From here, we can reach between the Muller and isolated fat pad here we have the buccal maxillary ligament. I don't suggest us to add a lot of volume here, but sometimes we need it when the tear thruff continues down there and create what's called the Indian groove. So for some patients, there might be an indication to make that injection between the fat pad in a more superficial layer. But be careful because we also have a lot of lymphatics running there. We can enter the pre space, and the pre space is located differently between different patients from around the world. So Caucasians, we have our pre space more laterally, as Asians have it more medially. We can identify the borders with the blunt microcannula. We're working with the 25 gauge KSK microcannula in this case. She's not in sedation, she doesn't have any blocks, and you can see that it's not a painful treatment in any way. 
If we go into the fat pad, same thing here, we can see how the cannula moves with a smile, something that we are not looking for. So let's look at the third indication, sharp needle. Is sharp needle injection safe? This is a question that we need to ask ourselves. We know more and more about the anatomy of the face, but we also know more and more of the big variation of anatomy between different patients. This paper came from a Korean uh, team and uh, they looked at uh, 35 cadavers and at the course of the branching patterns of the facial artery and uh, how it runs close to the nasolabial fold and nasojugal growth. What the group showed us is that basically in 77% of the cases the artery crosses or runs immediately of the nasolabial fold which means a high risk for sharp needle injection. Only in 23% of the cases it runs laterally. So of course with more and more knowledge of the big variations and that we don't know what we really can expect the artery to be located it's definitely more and more important to understand the importance of the use of microcannula. So what areas are safe to inject? We have blood vessels basically running all the way down from the DAO with the facial artery dividing to the inferior labial artery up to the superior labial artery up to the angular artery and sometimes even a connection up to the infraorbital artery. When looking at the anatomy we can also see that many of the arteries are interconnected which actually gives us a risk of retrograde migration and a disturbance of the optical artery meaning uh, blindness. So many doctors around the world they think that they might be safe from intravascular injections just due to aspiration. I, in my opinion this gives us false security. So let's have a look at aspiration of uh, some Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola definitely has a lower viscosity in blood and should be easier to aspirate than an intravascular uh, position. So let's start with the prime 29 gauge ultra thin wool needle. This is normal Restylane. The 29 gauge has the inside of a 27 gauge and this gives us a false negative result when we have gel in the needle of course it's more difficult to aspirate. This is a situation you have if you have already done an injection with that needle and syringe. So let's try a non-prime meaning there is no gel in the needle. Still due to the thinness of the needle it's false negative. If we go up to a 23 gauge we prime it still it's a false negative result. So the only way to be safe is to use a non-prime 23 gauge needle, meaning no gel in the needle, and we can get aspiration easily. So don't think that you're safe just because you aspirate. So sometimes we see sharp needle injections like this, and basically this might be dangerous. If we are lateral from the mid pupil line and we're on the bone there is basically no blood vessels there but if we come more medially it becomes also more dangerous. We need to know where foramen infraorbital is located in the mid pupil line and about two centimeters below the rim. So this is definitely a danger zone. If we go medial from this, I would say that this is a no-go zone. We should not do any sharp needle injections medial from the mid-pupil line and there's no reason to do it laterally also since we can do very safe and predictable injections with our microcannulas.
So I suggest we avoid sharp needle injections in the mid faces of our patients. We should try to use microcannulas. They give us an anatomical approach. She had one cc of prolane on her right side there and with a smooth, nice lifting effect to create a better definition. So before and immediately after, she had her cheeks augmented by one cc of prolane on each side, but to maintain balance, we also added about one cc of prolane in her chin. It's all about those areas interacting with each other, and we cannot only augment uh, cheeks because too much and then the patient will get out of balance and lose the harmony of her face. So during the years I've uh, met a lot of doctors and treated a lot of patients around the world and uh, a good friend of mine Dr. Peng introduced the importance of different areas. Dr. Peng works in Taiwan and uh, mainly attend to Asian patients. But even if we look at a young Caucasian patient like this, basically the same, same beautification principles applies to her. So what would be the most common treatment for her to ask for? Yes, it would be the mid-face or the M area. The second area a patient like this comes for and which also is important in the balance of the face is the T area. We talk about the T zone, we have the nose, and of course the very common lip augmentation. Finally, we have the V area. The sharpness, the definition of the jawline, important even if you're young or if you're more mature in your age. And if we put this together, we have the MTV indication basically a beautification indication attending to the MTV areas. So this patient had the MTV, she had her lips, her cheek, her chin, her mandibular line treated, and this creates an enhancement and beautification. It's quite a common treatment, same with Melina, you might remember her, one of my nurses. She had her cheeks, her lips done, her nose uh, augmented. But not all young patients are young, like these patients. We also have more mature patients. And looking at a more mature patient and the aging process, it's basically the mid-face which is the problem. Because when the mid-face falls down, it creates the symptoms. The symptoms of deepening nasolabial fold, deepening tear throth, deepening marionette lines, and more enhanced pre sulcus. So by adding volume in the mid-face, that will lift all these areas up and together. But of course we have the frown lines or the elevens. We have the inversion of the lip, so the T-zone is definitely important even for more our more mature patients. And then finally, it's the V area, the jawline. And I would say that 99% of all facelifts today, they're done due to uh, sagging of the jawline. So these three areas are very important, even if we just want to rejuvenate. We don't want to change. We don't want to enhance or alter the morphology of our patients. And when we treat them, and put them together, we can achieve really, really nice results with a non-surgical approach, adding volume in that mid-face, in the tear trough, in the nasolabial fold, and in the jawline, both in the pre sulcus and back at the angle of the mandible, just in front of the ear, which will stretch that uh, jawline very, very nicely. So this patient, she's a little bit more mature and she had only her mid-face done. She had a total of four cc's of hyaluronic acid injected into her mid-face. And we can see how really that, what we just talked about, the problem area, affects all the symptoms of the face. 
The same thing applies for men, of course. Steve here, he lost some volume in, her mid in his mid-face, a deepening nasolabial fold, and attending to those MTV areas rejuvenate him without changing or altering the morphology. And of course, doing this continuously, we have basically three phases of fillers. The first phase is a building up phase. Then we do touch up and finally only maintain this. This is a patient of mine. I've known her for many, many years and no surgery is done. She just done injections once or twice a year continuously. And looking at Eva Maria, I think that we can achieve really great long-lasting results by just doing fillers and we can all see how important that mid-phase volume is for her. So this was a short going through the different anatomical aspects of mid-phase and the importance of the area in both rejuvenation, in enhancement or remodeling. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, take advantage to follow us on our YouTube channel. More is coming. Bye.